Good afternoon, friends. Uh, on behalf of the Valley of Words and the National Digital Library of India and the United Services Institution, it's a great honor and privilege for me to welcome you all to this 14th edition of Afternoons with an Author. And today we have a very, very distinguished panel and an absolutely great book to discuss. The book that we are discussing is 1971. You've all gone through it. I mean, stories of uh, grit and villa. And the discussions we have with our today, we have General Pannu, who will be talking to the legendary General Ayan Cardozo. Uh, just two or three uh, lines before we actually get on. Uh, General Cardozo has shown that strength is mental. That if you are mentally strong, the world is with you. And you can conquer anything if your mind is strong. That reminds me of uh, uh, the emblem that we had at Khalsa College, Jalanda, which said, Man Jite Jagu Jite. Uh, I have with me General Pannu, a very dear friend, also a member of the Board of Governors of the Valley of Earths. Uh, he has been the Deputy Chief of Staff, has been responsible for many, many things, including bringing in artificial intelligence, new technology warfare. But let me not stand between you and the two remarkable generals. Over to you, General Pannu, for your brilliant conversation with General Cardozo. Uh, over to you, sirs. Uh, thank you, Dr. Chopra. Uh, Jai Hind, it is such a privilege that today I sit in front of uh, Major General Ayan Cardozo, a very respected uh, legend, a war hero. Everybody knows him, at least in the Indian Army, and I think largely world over because he has been talking about warfare and he's also sp spoken about his own experiences in the battle and also lifetime experiences that he's, uh, you know, generally shared with people as a writer and also as a speaker. I was also very privileged actually to stand next to him when he was commanding 10 Division. And I was a youngster, a major, and we stood under the same cabinet, very close to a Pakistani border that is a line of control, where he was giving very, very clear, crisp, you know, briefings from his heart. And I could see that there is a soldier in him who is doing everything that should go right, but is also preparing for every eventuality that could go wrong. Having uh, come from a military background myself, I have heard tales from my father about Second World War and right up to 1965, post which he superannuated and he went to farm. And we saw 1971 war from a rooftops as youngsters. And I did realize at that time that the war, which I'm actually watching from the rooftop from about 20 kilometers away from Pakistan border, was being fought by my own battalion about 2,000 kilometers away in East Pakistan. And then later when I married, my wife came from again a military background. My father-in-law fought all the wars. So therefore, for my uh, about four decades of live participation in the military and the history that you know has been told to us and how we've been hearing and seeing things on ground, I feel very, very enamored with what General Cardozo has written about in this book, 1971, Stories of Grit and Glory from the Indo-Pak War. And I see General Cardozo sitting in front of me live, and I still, even though one has seen combat, one has read uh, military history, but I still have a chill you know, running down my spine when I think about what he has done and what he has written in this book. Um, Sir, General Cardozo, sir, what a privilege that I sit in front of you. I have far too many questions to ask a commentator that how could you write a book as if you were sitting in a commentator's box and giving a live commentary about minute to minute, hour to hour, and week after week, the larger picture of the globe and coming down to tactical and operations, you know, even a single man was fighting and how he was looking literally through the barrel of his gun. I'm really enamored. And, you know, I would want to hear from you. And it would be really good for the youngsters. Last 50 years of glorious war that the country is proud of is not actually being spoken about like this. And this year that we sit in this month, Yahya Khan, at that time, the president of Pakistan was threatening India that he would take us to war. And I would now not stand between 
you know, youngsters and people who'd like to listen to General Cardozo and tell him, sir, you have written such a beautiful book. Please give us something about why you wrote this book. But I will ask you a question in which you would tell me why you wrote this book. In this book, you have never spoken about yourself in first person initially, not even second person. You are talking about some officer who came from staff college. And when that officer comes from staff college, the staff college course actually was not, you know, yet culminated, but you know, you were asked to move away and go and fight a battle that your nation was fighting. And then you must have gone through, you know, certain thoughts in your mind till the time you landed up at the heliodrome from where your battalion was being lifted to a place called Silit, and with full knowledge that your unit, 45GR, had gone through Ghazipur and Atgram. That was the last Kukri battle, as you say, was fought, but also it was the first airlift or the heliport lift which the Indian Army was, you know, going through. And when you reached there, your men received you and lifted you on their shoulders, and there was a huge amount of jubilation when the battalion was actually facing challenges and being fired upon from all the all the directions and you were encircled but there is some amount of you know that josh that your men had when they lifted you off the helicopter in some amount of jubilation only to receive their wazir and you would tell me why later on you were called a wazir so i would want to know more about that young officer from staff college who landed up in silhouette in a helicopter so please explain to us what was your feeling and why did they lift you with that, that kind of a jubilation during the hot battle? Uh, firstly, uh, I'd like to say that uh, the Gurkha soldier is uh, not only bravest of the brave, but he otherwise is also a very uh, a person who is very happy. Uh, in the 1965 war, I was commanding Alpha Company of 45 GR, and uh, the battalion was the reserve battalion of the division. So we were fighting fires all over the division. And as far as my battalion was concerned, Alpha Company was used again and again. I lost my company's second in command, I lost my platoon commanders, I lost my NCOs. And uh, since we saw such a lot of action, uh, it was uh, quite a surprise when I landed at Silet to find three or four grinning Gurkha faces looking up at me and saying, Kartu Saab, Kartu Saab, Hoiti Haina. And not only that, then they took me on their shoulders and started dancing. So, uh, General Pannu, I, I think uh, if anybody asks me what is the most uh, what is the greatest privilege as far as the army is concerned? What is the greatest honor I, I received? It was the reception that my Gurkha Johnnies gave me when I landed at Silet. Because uh, being considered as one of them, as being equally brave, uh, I think there's no greater honor than that. So that is what happened that day. I had to tell them, now please put me down, there's a war on, for God's sake, let me go and meet the CEO. And then they put me down and ran off to their position, they were guarding the helipad. So that was how I was received. Uh, at that time, uh, we did not know it. Fortunately, we did not know it because we had been told that uh, 202 Infantry Brigade, which is holding Select, has moved for the defense of Dhaka. There's nobody there except two or three hundred Razaka, that is the untrained soldiers. But when we landed, we were met with a lot of artillery fire, medium machine gun fire, etc. So we thought to ourselves that there seems to be something wrong with that message, that intelligence report that there's nothing here. There seems to be quite a lot. And initially, they uh, tried to attack the heli uh, at the helipad. We we uh, brushed them off and pushed them back. What uh, perhaps I think what uh, the listeners should know is that what General Panu referred to as the last Kukri attack in modern military history. 
uh, before we landed at Silet, four or five Gurkhas had fought two battles. One battle at the Battle of Atgram and one battle at the Battle of Ghazipur. At the Battle of Atgram, uh, since we belonged to 8th Mountain Division, which was uh, counterinsurgency in uh, Nagaland, we didn't have any artillery. So we went in without artillery and the Lieutenant Colonel Arun Bhimra Harolikar. He said, uh, since there's no artillery, the best way we can capture our ground is by a surprise attack. Let us uh, attack at night and, uh, and attack them from a direction which is uh, not expected of them. So we attacked them from the rear and we did, uh, we had no artillery. <coughs> So we launched this Khukri attack and that night, that moonlight night, Khukri's flashed and lopped off 32 Pakistani heads. We decimated Charlie Company of 31 Punjab. Now, perhaps uh, people in the audience won't know what a Khukri is. So I anticipated this and I brought a Khukri for you to see. This is what a Khukri looks like. This is not a battle Khukri. A battle cookery is about 14 to 16 inches, a, a blade of 14 to 16 inches. You can see a little notch over here. That notch is to prevent the blood from making the handle slippery. So uh, this is an excellent weapon. It's broad on the top. It tapers down to the bottom and the bottom is very, very, very sharp. So uh, when we when we were at the Silat helipad and we found that the, uh, the Pakistanis didn't have the stomach to come to us and fight in close quarter battle. And probably the reason for that was because of the of the of the effect of the cookeries of cold steel at the Battle of Atgram. Following the Battle of Atgram, there was another battle to be fought again. It was a place called Ghazipur, where another battalion had not been able to capture it, and the co-commander General Sagat said, "Send the Gurkhas." So we went in. What I'd like to say is we captured Ghazipur, but within these two battles, one after, immediately one after the other, we had lost uh, three officers killed and four officers wounded. We had entered the war with just 18 officers, and now within a week we had lost, we had left with only 11 officers. So the CO was, uh, had asked for a few days to reorganize the battalion, that's when we got the message that uh, you are needed to know now go and capture Silet. Uh, have I answered the question, Jan Panu, or should I carry on? So fantastic. I mean, with the run, you know, that is there in your head about the battal battalion's performance one after the other. My mind was actually, you know, diverted when you were talking about the last Kukri attack. And my mind went down to last year's action at Galwan, where Indian troops actually, in a hand-to-hand -hand fight, actually hacked down a number of Chinese soldiers. You know, there is a speculation, some say 60 and some say 70 or whatever. But what I'm saying is that when a soldier fights and when an officer is in command of men, there is a connect that, you know, comes with a trust that you have in your superiors that they would guide you correctly, give you correct information and give you correct orders. And also, you have a faith in your men, and men have a faith that you have described that our officer is going to lead you to success. And at the end of it, we are going to be victorious in whatever our officers and wherever the, our officers lead us into, even if it is a valley of death. What kind of a willingness is there in our men, and what kind of a faith and trust that you have in your senior leadership? who at a distance is giving you orders and then you're actually connecting that into an action with your men on ground. Can you please tell me about this connect of faith and trust? Uh, thank you, General Pandu. I think I'd like to go a little beyond that in the sense that 
India is a very spiritual country and uh, irrespective of the faith that we believe in, we all believe that there is a God. So there is trust in God, there is trust in our superiors, there is faith in our soldiers, there is faith in ourselves, our confidence and that faith in ourselves and our confidence comes from a, a clear perception of what we have to do, a clear aim, a clear strategy and in battle there is no time to think, there is only time to act. So in the army, in starting from the NDA and the IMA and the unit and all courses of, act, of instruction, we are taught that we need to know our jobs so well that when the acid test of a soldier in battle comes, we react immediately and don't have to think or wait for orders. So that is what is important in the way that a soldier is brought up. And I think uh, for us people in uniform, I would like to state that there is no greater privilege that taking commanding men and taking them into battle. This is an awesome, awesome responsibility and falls on very young soldier, so young officer. And uh, uh, I would like you to know that the code name for every commander from, from a section commander to the army commander, he is known as a tiger. The code name for commanders is tiger. So the young officer is the tiger which his soldiers follow. He leads from the front. He doesn't say, Tum aage jao, my piche aur raha hu. He says instead, Mere piche mu, which means follow me. And the so Indian soldier, the best soldier in the world, follows his officers without hesitation because he knows that his young tiger is there right in front, facing the maximum brunt of the enemy the maximum danger and if he dies then it is it falls upon their shoulders the JCOs and the NCOs to take the battle forward and capture the objective. So this is what the army is all about and as I said people of different faiths have fought shoulder to shoulder in every war that we have fought before independence, after independence, today and tomorrow because our, our lives depend upon each other. My life depends upon somebody else and somebody else's life depends upon me. And it is up to us to take the battle forward because the most important thing that we are required to do is victory in battle. And victory in battle is the primary aim because we put country first. And country first means the people of India. So, uh, yeah, and I think uh, to answer your question, General Pandu, to the last is that uh, uh, the most important word in the vocabulary of a soldier is the four letter word called love. Now many people in the audience will say what does he know about love? But it is love. It is on the altar of love that men and women in uniform put their lives in the line of fire and sometimes when required disappear in the smoke and fire of battle because it is love for the country, love for the people of India, love for the regiment, love for the soldier, love for the cause and love for the life of adventure. A life in the army is incomparable. It is a life that has no equal. So those of you who are from the signing schools and the NCC or wherever, do think about a career in the armed forces because it is the life of adventure. When I was a young officer and I was moving to my post, we used to stop at uh, uh, transit camps, the replica of the old Mughal Sarais. And in the evening, we'd get together in front of a fire with a glass of rum or whiskey and listen to the old timers telling us about battles fought in World War II and 1947 war. And we used to ask ourselves, I wonder when we will have similar tales to tell. But I'd like to tell you, we, once you join the army, you don't have to look for adventure. Adventure will come looking for you. 
and you have only one life to live. So live it to the full. Life is an adventure or it is nothing. You have to decide what you want to do with that life that God has given you. Use it to the best of your ability. I think we went off screen for a little while. Um, so, yes, uh, sir. But I, I am really, really, you know, moved by what you're talking about love and, uh, you know, giving life for love. Uh, in 1971 war, you know, 3,840 killed, 9,851 wounded. And we still have 54 prisoners of war languishing in Pakistan jail collectively of not 1971 war or even the wars fought before. When I was building the war memorial, I was having a privilege of being the chairman to supervise the construction of it. And the war memorial has been built by bricks and each brick has a you know name written in golden uh, letters. And each brick has a story to tell. And, you know, in this book of yours, you have compiled about 11 essays and 11 tales to tell. And we have 26,975 uh, odd and counting. And I think between the time the war memorial was built, we have, we have lost many, many, many more. But what I would want to uh, understand from you is that every time we lose a, uh, you know, a gallant soldier or an officer, and I think officer's casualty is very high, uh, and they lead the men to battle. What is there that in our men that, and what is there in our officers that even if it is INS Kukri, where a frigate is moving around, you know, in the Arabian Sea and being chased by a definite class uh, submarine, a superior sum submarine, a superior equipment to an outdated frigate, that captain of the ship, Captain Mahendra Pratap, uh, Mullah, uh, once he's hit, the ship goes down and he's right standing on top and he goes down with the ship. Did he go down with his men or did he go down because he thought that was it that he stood for and if the ship is not there and men are there, he has no, no right to live. Why do such things happen in war that the officers choose to go down with the men? Uh, I think I partially answered your question earlier in the sense that uh, uh, we basically, I think it, it, it revolves around that word love. Uh, we are always told, uh, Sam Maniksha put it very well, and he said when he took over four corps from General Call in 1962, he said, remember one thing, gentlemen, you are dispensable. The army is dispensable, but the country is not dispensable. Therefore, always put country first. And that is what we do as officers. We've always put country first. <clears throat> Sorry. We always put country first. And as you rightly said, the maximum percentage of casualties is always the officer because he's right in front. In the 1971 war, my battalion, the 4th Battalion, the 5th Gurkha Rifles. As I said, we started the war with 18 officers. We entered the war with 18 officers. And at the end of that war of 13 days, only seven survived. Seven meaning uh, seven who were unscathed and with minor wounds. So uh, we are imbibed with right from the beginning in NDA, the cradle of leadership of the armed forces armed forces, Army, Navy, Air Force, service before self. And in the Indian Military Academy, we are told, the safety, honor, and welfare of your country come first, always and every time. The safety, honor, and welfare of your men come next. And your own honor, safety, and comfort come last, always and every time. So we don't think about ourselves. We only think about others. Whether it is in war or whether it is in peace, it is always the army which is called out because they, it is fully, the country knows it can be relied upon. It can be trusted to deliver, not only in peace, but also in war. And therefore, 
uh, we it is it is the question of I think values and those values is in the Indian tradition the tradition of India which some of us are forgetting today in this modern world is the family I used to listen to my stories of my mother and my father my father kept a scrapbook of World War II and right from my from a very young age he used to tell me what's happening in in, in, in Europe and Asia and Africa and uh, that scrapbook unfortunately I don't know where it is now and he used to get books for me to read about the military so uh, it starts from the family it progresses to the school and it is the teacher who is now responsible to shape those values keeping country first and therefore uh, it is it is our, our, our teachers and I, I would like to state over here that uh, it is the we most of our teachers in St. Xavier school right up to the fifth class were lady teachers so uh, in most schools that is similar so that is the most impressionable age so the girl child is most important because the girl becomes a wife a girl becomes a mother a grandmother a teacher and has a great influence upon how we behave how we uh, the values that we imbibe and uh, and these values translate into habits if you have good habits they last forever and it is these good habits which are then fostered and built upon in the army which tells us how to live and behave in peace so that we can fight and die in war with courage and with honor so it is many factors that makes us do what we do also it is factors of honor of courage of uh, love and in this respect again I'd like to bring your attention to our wives and mothers in the armed forces it is our wives and mothers who are the backbone of the army we are able to do what we do because we know we have their firm and strong support so this is what makes the army tick it is values good habits and understanding of country and uh, uh, I'd like also slightly to put it in the right perspective in the sense uh, does it, do we want to make India the most powerful country in the world do we want to make India the most rich, uh, the richest country in the world when I was talking to a school a young boy put his hand up 12 year old boy and he said sir do you want India to be the most powerful country in the world the richest country in the world or the best country in the world and I think this young boy got it right he had the right philosophy at that young age we need to make our country the best country in the world where everybody is happy very everybody is at peace everybody loves each other everybody loves what they do do what they love is never afraid and never to face every challenge with all that we have so yes India can be the best country in the world provided we have the right vision and that vision has to have the right infrastructure the right strategy and that strategy has to have the right infrastructure and when we have that infrastructure we need to have the right aims the right objectives and uh, when we talk about vision we talk about 30 40 50 years down the line but that 50 year period has to be divided into smaller periods of time so we get the right objectives if this happens then perhaps there'll be no looking back we need to have that vision I'm sorry to say we don't have it now when I was in the IDSA uh, the then Raksha Mantri Mr. Sri Anthony uh, he doesn't talk much but that day he was he said the armed forces need to have a vision and everybody kept quiet and I stood up and I said excuse me Raksha Mantri the army cannot have its own vision unless the country has a vision you have to give us a vision from every from which every ministry every armed force everybody 
can draw their own vision, their own strategy, their own objectives, etc. So uh, I hope I've not got a little diverted, but I think it all links up. It all links up. Take the Olympics today. I hope we do well, but is it part of our vision? Is, a, is it a part of our, our, our policy of soft power? So we I, have a billion people. The armed forces have the best, healthiest people in the world. You think we can't earn bagfuls of medals? We can. But why did we want to do it? Somebody has to want to do it and make sure we do it. So that is it, what his vision is all about. Yes, sir. I'm coming back to these sentiments. But very quickly, I'll ask you that you know you've had the advantage of having experienced combat. You know, are you, our uh, country fought, you know, all major battles in the first 25 years. And uh, you have participated in all. Now, I would know from your experience that what, how do you draw similarities in all these battles, but what stood out so differently in 1971? <laughs> I'm glad you asked that question, General Panu. The answer is that uh, it's something to do with what I've already said. In all these wars, uh, the, the armed forces were not prepared. India was not prepared in 47, 48 for what Pakistani did. India was not prepared for what China did in 62. We were not prepared for in 65. We were not prepared in uh, 1999 in Kargil. Uh, we put some amount of blame on the intelligence, but I think uh, we cannot blame them entirely. The fault lies each and every one of us. Um, and uh, the only time we were prepared was in 1971. Thanks to the courage of General Sam Manikshaw, who, when, when he was told by the Prime Minister to march into East Pakistan in the month of April, he said, sorry, ma'am, we are not prepared. The, min the ministry, uh, the ministers of defense and finance are sitting here. I have been begging them for what I need to make our armed forces ready for war, but they have not even answered me. So the question is, either it is we either prepare or we perish. We cannot afford not to be prepared. In the OTA, there is a saying, the enemy is preparing to kill you. What are you doing about it? And therefore, to answer your question, we were prepared for 71 war and we won a glorious victory. So we need to prepare. Today we have the possibility of a two front war with China and Pakistan. Today we have China doing its best to push us across the line of control, actual control in the dark. So unless we have the best weapons, unless we have the best leadership, and the best leadership is also important. I don't want to say too much about it, but leadership matters, weapons matters, because this is what builds morale. As General Slim has said, morale is the most important battle winning factor. There are 10 principles of war. Morale is one of them. And therefore, we need to be prepared always and every time. There are many pacifists in this country who do not want to sacrifice guns for butter. They feel that too much money is being spent on defense. Well, we've been slaves to the Mughals and then the British. Do you want to be slaves again? We need to prepare. We meet, need to make a sacrifice. We need to give the army, the navy and the air force the wherewithal to meet the enemy on equal terms and destroy the enemy and achieve victory in war. So unless we prepare for war, we are not going to do well. General Cardozo, sir, you know, I'm very conscious that there's a one general who spent about four decades in uniform speaking to another general who also uh, spent, you know, equal amount in uniform and also fought all major battles. But you know, sometimes you often hear war is too important to be left to generals alone. How is this that men are fighting isolated battles and they have to take decisions which are, you know, certain decisions, you know, you landed up taking in Silhad and then Agram, 
Kazipur, and then you know how the race to Dhaka was happening. And then, you know, there are certain isolated movements where, where officers are struggling and generals are struggling with directions and the achievements. And, you know, you are also racing against time. How is it that the statement that it is too serious a business to be left to generals alone, is it a conditional statement when men fight unconditionally? I think this is a statement used by politicians and bureaucrats to do the army down in the sense that War is too, too serious a business to be left to generals. Well, then who is going to be left to? Who is going to lead the army? Who is going to decide what happens in the future? How are you going to win future battles? So the question, I think, boils down to the fact that in the armed forces, you, you would remember that in the in the Kargil War, uh, General Wade Malik had to state, "We will fight with what we have." In 1962, the American journalist said, "In the Indian Armed Forces, have every have have lack everything except courage." So we didn't have the right weapons in 1962. We didn't have the right weapons in 1999. Today, the army has moved forward and General Pando, you are in, uh, I, I'm a little out of sync with what is happening today, but you are a general of the uh, more recent era and talk, talk about cyber warfare and digital warfare and all that sort of thing. So the point is, uh, we should never be thinking of the last war to fight the next war. What happened in 1971 can never be replicated. Never again will that happen. We have to think about what would happen in the future. And for that, you require vision. You've got to think, look ahead, do crystal ball gazing. What is happening worldwide? What will happen 20 years, 10 years, five years down the line? And how should we prepare? Do we have the, 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 the weather we're all to, to fight a future war on two fronts? So, uh, uh, also, um, perhaps you, know, you, you're in a better yes, position to comment, to comment on this because you are more conversant with what is happening today. But this is all that I can say is that uh, when we are given, irrespective of whether it is the last war, the present war, or the future war, we are told, put country first and do your best. So it boils down to four things that Manik Shaw told me when I, uh, long, in 1964, when I was getting my Sena medal. Uh, General Sam Manik, so I asked him for some advice. Uh, we are from the same regiment, uh, the 5th Gurkha Rifles. And he said, son, uh, do what you love. That's what we are in the army. That's what the army is all about. We are there because we are doing what we love. And then he said, love what you do. And loving what you do means you have to be the best. You have to go to the extreme to understand your profession, be professionally competent, so that the ultimate test in war, victory in war, is never compromised. So do what you love. Love what you do. You. Be the best. Never be afraid. Um, he, he said that all men are afraid of something. Some men are afraid of many things. And if anybody says he's not afraid, <clears throat> he's either a liar or a gurkha. So it is not that we are not afraid. We are afraid, but we have to conquer fear. And lastly, he said, never give up. So when we went into select and we were faced uh, with a ratio of 20 to 1, we were 384 and they were nearly uh, 8,000. We never, we, we did what we loved, we loved what we did. We were not afraid, we never gave up and ultimately victory was ours. 
So that is, I think, uh, And I'd like to add here that uh, risk taking is the army, the armed forces are probably the only institution in the world and in, and in India where risk taking is a part of management and leadership. And General Sagar took that risk and he sent us 384 against two brigades and, and the garrison, which was, I told you how, how much we faced. But risk taking is a part of our decision making he took that risk but it depended upon lieutenant colonel arun bimrao haralikar the ceo of 45 gr I, I see some disturbance in the link. Uh, I am not uh, very sure whether General Cardozo is uh, hearing me or not. Um, I would just, uh, you know, hope that he comes back. Uh, we don't complain uh, that we don't have this and we come back. We, we have to do with whatever we have and we hope those who are listening and the country will give us what we need so that we fight the next ba battle on equal terms with the enemy. Sir, I'll, I'll quickly ask two questions because, you know, I, I wish we could uh, talk about it all day. But, you know, I will take you to an international arena where Pakistan had all the support from the West and also from China and, of course, you know, from the Middle East. Yet, actually, when they came to fight a, a battle, uh, nothing materialized. So what should a person understand from here when the guarantees and the alliances are being promised? What would, would India take from here when we have to go for future wars, which are going to be based on alliances and guarantees and agreements? Uh, can I have your comment on, you know, depending yes. on foreign powers to bail you out? Uh, not to bail us out, but uh, if you look at World War II, there were alliances between Germany and Austria and Italy and Turkey on one side and Britain and the Commonwealth countries and France and Belgium on one side. So they were alliances. They have to be alliances because future wars are not going to be fought only on land. It's going to be fought in the air, on the sea, under the sea, over the sea, in other countries. So we need to have alliances. And when Indira Gandhi, our prime minister, was faced with Pakistan having alliance with China and USA, who had confirmed that they would come to Pakistan's aid if it was attacked by India. Her master stroke was to have a friendship agreement with the Soviet Union. And I request everybody when they go to this book to remember the Soviet Union, the Russians stood by us through thick and thin, not only in the war at sea, but also in the United Nations of, uh, in the in the, on the floors of the United Nations when they stood by us with veto after veto to allow, to allow us to wrap up the war before the Americans or the Chinese could come to the aid of Pakistan. So alliances are important, but also we need to understand that ultimately you have to stand on your own two feet. You've got to have the leg on the ground and you've got to have uh, faith in yourself and accept whatever else is available in the form of alliances to fight an all-out war across different boundaries and barriers. Brilliant, brilliant, sir. You know, you said something that you have to stand on your two feet yourself. And my mind goes back to your personal life when at Silhet, actually over a blast, you lost your leg and you had to use your own cookery to actually amputate your leg and to be treated by a doctor in which you said, I'm not going to take Pakistani blood in my body. I'd rather die. But you know, later on, when you went through surgery and then you know you were in the artificial limb center, you also said that, no, I don't know if I have to leave the army. 
what would it be outside the army? And you know, there is somebody who was taking care of you, gave you a book, uh, you know, to make you feel that you know you have only one leg, and you're talking about two. But there is somebody, a uh, British, uh, you know, uh, a fighter, uh, Air Force fighter, who actually fought without two legs. Uh, so how do you carry these sentiments from when you're fighting a battle, you lose your limb, you cut your own, uh, you know, and then no. and further go on to live a life uh, post the army? Do you have a message in all this that I've spoken about? Uh, but, yeah, when, I, when we were in hospital uh, at that time, there was no policy for battle casualties and we were told that in, in no way can you go back to command of troops. But uh, at that, and we were very, very disillusioned. We were very disenchanted because we felt that the army had forgotten us. We who had fought that war were now being left behind. And was my fault, was it my fault that I got wounded? And it was Sam Manikshaw who came to our rescue and said that who will stick out his neck in a future war? if we don't look after our widows and our battle casualties. And coming back to your question, uh, somebody gave me a book. The book, the title of the book was Reach for the Sky. It is a story about Douglas Bader, who lost both legs in an accident. But the British Air Force allowed him to fly. He became a war ace, which meant that he shot down 21 German aircraft before being shot down himself over Germany. And when he had to bail out of his Spitfire or his Hurricane, both his wooden legs got trapped in the cockpit and he landed on his stumps and got hurt very badly. So he was taken to hospital and they asked, the Germans asked him, what do you want? So he said, I have a pair of duplicate legs in, in Britain. Can you get an aircraft to fly them over? So both Germany and Britain agreed to fly his legs over. Dakota was dropped his artificial legs over the hospital and they gave him his legs. What did Douglas Bader do that night with his two wooden legs? It was winter, it was snowing. With those two wooden legs, he escaped. But how far could he go in the snow? He was caught. How far could he go crawling in the snow? He was caught and put into a high security prison at Colditz. But it shows the spirit of never say die, never give up. And I thought to myself, if Douglas Bader could do that with minus two legs, why cannot I also attempt to get command of troops? It's a long story. It will be told in my next book, title of which is Kartu Saab, which outlines this story and many other things which General Pandu has talked about answers lie in that next book which will probably be uh, released sometime by Roli Books. I bring you to the same theme which Sam Manik so said, do what you love, love what you do, don't be afraid, never give up. Fantastic, sir. I mean, you've taken us through the entire 1971 war and not only that, much, much beyond about your human behavior, a soldier's life and how the nation must behave. And I think you have left a great message. I wish I had asked you more about, you know, the bullet for breakfast and the, and the Beep's best broadcast and what is there in store for us, we have no idea. But you know, our officers fight with the hope of success and not from the fear of failure, even if they have to fight with whatever, even if it is a kitchen knife. You know, I think that, you know, this is highly, highly inadequate time, but I think you've covered it so brilliantly. Uh, I, those who have heard you speak, I think they would be fascinated if they pick up a copy of this book and I think they will see 
for themselves what happened 50 years back. And I think your commentary, as I said, like you know, you're sitting in the commentator's box and giving you know day, day by day account of each battle is so very brilliant. Thank you very much, General Cardozo, sir. Uh, I'm, I'm so privileged to have spoken with you on this account. Thank you very much, General Pannu. Thank you very much, General Thank Cardozo. You. It's been an absolutely wonderful afternoon. Uh, we have a host of questions, uh, but I've tried to bracket the questions into three categories. Uh, so uh, I'll ask those questions and let's hope that uh, we have, I mean, we have very little time. Therefore, I'll, I'll bracket the question. The first set of questions, General Cardozo, is about uh, how did you uh, keep, uh, I mean, what were your feeling when you joined the army for the first time? The first feeling when you joined the army, how did you keep your fears and tensions away in the battle? And linked to this is the fact that uh, uh, how did you keep yourself motivated? So this is a set of three questions uh, which you may respond uh, together. Uh, see, uh, when I joined the army, I had already been conditioned. Firstly, as I said, we need to understand that the country is faced with many challenges. And unless and every citizen of this country, every man, woman and child has a stake in the security of India. And therefore, my, uh, my conditioning started at home, followed up by my school, St. Javier's School, Bombay, followed up by the NDA, followed up by the IMA, where we were conditioned to face whatever challenges and treat them as opportunities rather than as challenges. So when I joined my battalion, the 1st Battalion, the 5th Kolkata Rifles, we, uh, we were sent, uh, the Chinese operation started at, at that time in 1959, when China had occupied Tibet, and we were sent to Nifa. And there we faced tremendous challenges. But as I said before, we were conditioned to face all the challenges. We never took it as something which is a problem. We took it as a challenge, uh, as an opportunity, because we were all together. We were a team. It was I was never isolated. I was part of a team. We held on to each other. We helped each other to achieve whatever had to be achieved. And uh, in, in the battlefield, I remember uh, after I was, uh, I was, my company was detailed to relieve Punch. Punch was cut off by the infiltrators. We broke the ambush, reached Punch. We were treated like heroes. And then we, on coming back, we were ambushed. And after that, and we suffered heavy casualties. And after that, we had to attack a feature called Gajna. And uh, while the CEO was briefing us, I explained to him, I said, sir, these are two ridges coming down. That ridge also needs to be held. He said, uh, uh, Kartus, Kartus, why are you bothered? Because of your casualties, you are now in reserve. So you don't have to worry. However, he took action and had that target that ridge registered as a target. But when he started moving up and all hell broke loose, what did he say? He said, Kartus in Nepali, he said, Kartus Kastohola which means, Ian, how about it? Now, I was told that your company is under strength. You are not going to be launching the attack. You're going to be in reserve. And now suddenly when, the, when all the bullets were flying, he says, how about it? I never thought, even for a minute, I just got my company forward and we went up that slope, suffered heavy casualties. But we captured Gajra with the help of Charlie Company, which came up because we were too few. We beat back two counterattacks. And I sent him out. By this time, the wireless set had been broken. My, my, my runner, Jumbadur, had been killed. I had no way of communicating with my commanding officer. So I sent the wireless operator to tell the CEO, I said, that unless he sends reinforcements, Alpha Company will not exist anymore. And Charlie Company came up, and we then beat back the last the 
uh, attacked by the by the guerrillas. So I'm trying to say, uh, never give up. We do what we do because we have that in us to keep on doing what we have to do to the last, last man and the last drum. There are many, yes. many stories to tell. This is only one of them. Yes, I love what you do and do what you love. That's the spirit. Uh, one more question before we can uh, we can take only one more question. And the question uh, is that is war the only way to prepare for peace? Or in other words, we can say that I mean, if you want peace, be prepared for war. So your comments on this, although you've already said once that yes, that is what it is, but maybe you can elaborate on this for in one or two lines. Yes, uh, it, it's a good question. War is not the only answer to preserve peace. But preparation for war is the only answer for peace. If you, uh, if the questioner has read history, he would he would remember in World War II, Chamberlain tried to negotiate with Hitler, and in the last month before the war, he said peace in our time, but that never happened. Nature abhors the vacuum. If there is a vacuum, somebody will fill it. If we are not prepared, somebody will take advantage of us, as China is trying to do now. So, yes, war is not the only answer to peace. In fact, war is not the answer to peace. The answer to peace is to be prepared for war. Wonderful, sir. What a lovely way to end the discussion today, that if you want peace, be prepared for war. Before we close, ladies and gentlemen, take a look at the marigold which General Cardozo is wearing. General Cardozo has this mission of making marigold the national flower of remembrance. And we at Valley of Words are very privileged that three years ago, he launched it when he was here with us at Dehradun at the physical session of Valley of Words. Maybe you would like to speak something about marigold as the flower of remembrance. General Cardozo, please. Yes. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Chopra. The thing is this, that as General Pandu has said, lest we forget, we must never forget our war dead. The Commonwealth countries have the poppy as the flower of remembrance. The uh, America, France, Russia, Belgium have their own flower of remembrance. Why don't we have our own marigold as the flower of remembrance of India's war dead? It is the greatest tribute that we can pay. And as General Pannu has said in the National War Memorial, the, it is about time that we also combine the National War Memorial and our reverence for the war dead with a symbol that symbolizes what the war dead, the war dead need to be remembered. And there's no better way than the marigold. Thank you very Thank much. You, General. Thank you very much, General Pannu. It's been a absolutely wonderful afternoon, uh, you know, and, and this has been a very comprehensive discussion, a comprehensive discussion in which we've discussed values, we've discussed habits, we've asked, um, and he's also shown how important it is for schools and families to ensure that all of us are prepared, that India can win a war only if India is prepared, and that preparation must start with the family, it must start with the school. General Cardozo has drawn our attention to the fact that future wars cannot be based on past experience alone. So we cannot just be happy and celebrate the victory of 1971. We have to be prepared for challenges in the future. And for that, we need to understand geopolitics. For that, we need to understand domestic politics. For that, we need to build consensus. For that, we need to build a constituency that we talk to each other. And as General Cardozo said, that in the Indian Army, every part of India participates. It's an army in which there is a Naga, there's an army in which there's a Dogra. It's an army which has all faiths together. It's an army which represents the best of India. It's an army which is the pride of India. So let's celebrate the Indian Army. Let's celebrate India. Jai Hind, thank you for joining us in this afternoon session of Value of Words. General Cardozo wants to say the last word. Over to you, sir, for the last word. The last word is I want to thank Dr. Sanjeev Chopra for yes, initiating sir. this discussion and making us all available 
for this wonderful discussion and to General Pannu for asking me all the lovely questions that he had so that I could give the right answers. Thank you so much. God bless you both and God bless Valley of Words is doing a great job. Thanks to you. Thank you, sirs. Jai Hind. Jai Hind. Jai Hind, General Cardozo. Jai Hind, Dr. Chopra. Thank you. Thank you, sirs.